grace. All of us need your forgiveness to wash into our lives and, and to make us new. And Father, today we simply confess that, praising you because you're the God who is able to redeem our lives, who is able to deliver us from hell, who is able to, to lift us up out of the pit. And Father, we want to shine as lights in this world. No matter how dark it gets around us, it, the darkness cannot extinguish the light. You have called us to be children of God. Teach us how to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, this morning, uh, before we dive into uh, the message, I want to take a moment and uh, talk about some of the, the stuff that transpired this week. Uh, a lot of you are asking about uh, where do I stand, where does the church stand on uh, the Supreme Court decision on Friday, um, uh, legalizing same-sex marriage in all 50 states. And um, so I, I want to start off by just kind of sharing um, some thoughts that may help you uh, process or know where we stand, where, uh, where I stand, because I'll start off personal. Um, and, and, and as a pastor, as pastor of Calvary, uh, I and the other pastors uh, here in the church uh, can only officiate, will only officiate uh, and bless biblical marriages, um, now, a biblical marriage is uh, a marriage described in Scripture as between a man and a woman that is a committed monogamous relationship that lasts a lifetime. And, and that's the goal. That's the, the idea that, that God created and wants us to bless. And, and, and we're committed to only blessing those marriages. Now, uh, you may want to know why or you may not want to know why, but here's the thing. It's not uh, because we're against something. It's not because we're condemning. I mean, Jesus said the Son did not come to condemn the world, but that the world could be saved through him. Uh, I'm a servant of God. Uh, and as a servant of God, it is my responsibility to represent Christ to the world. And by the way, if you're a follower of Christ, it's your responsibility to represent Christ to the world as well. And, um, and I, as a spokesman for God... I can only speak what God tells me to speak. I can only speak what God, I can only bless what God blesses. And, and so, um, I, you know, when God blesses something, then we go, go, hey, we all get to enjoy that. When God doesn't bless something, we can't decide that it, he's going to bless it anyway. See, that's how it is with God. We come to God and, on his terms, not our terms. And we get to live in his blessings uh, if we do life his way. And if we don't do life his way, we can ask him to bless it, but he's not going to. Because he's God and we're not. So I'm, I'm bound by what, uh, what God tells me and what God blesses. And so the pastors of this church will, will officiate and bless uh, biblical marriages. Now, for the church as a whole, some of you are kind of going, hey, you know, how do we process this? How do we deal with this? Because some of you uh, are angry and frustrated, and some of you may be excited and happy, and you may be all over the place on the ruling. Uh, and, and I want you to think about this in terms of, of how uh, God uh, thinks. You see, the Supreme Court of the United States of America redefined marriage on Friday. But the Supreme Court cannot redefine our mission See, the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's our mission. Our mission, our goal is not to fight a culture war. You realize that Jesus said he's come into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. That's his mission. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring life to people. He, he wants to provide forgiveness of sins. He wants to lift people up. And, and, uh, and so that's our mission. So if your you know, reaction is one of anger, then realize that the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. You might feel angry. You might want to express your opinions and social media and things like that. And I'm just telling you, that's not what God wants you to do. Because it doesn't matter uh, where people are in their lifestyle, guys. It doesn't matter what people are doing. If they're far from God, they're far from God. And, and we're not ever going to lead people to Jesus Christ if we're angry and yelling. You, you understand that, right? That we're called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people. 
and the power of his truth. So we need to live the truth and we need to show the love. Uh, whether people agree with us or disagree with us, whether they bless us or curse us, it doesn't matter. We represent the ethic of Jesus Christ to this world. And that's what we're called to do. So I wanted you to know that, uh, and, and if this is something that you're, you're still wanting to, to talk about more, think about more, a book that I think will really help you process where we are is uh, this book I just finished reading. Uh, our church staff's going to be start reading it tomorrow, uh, and uh, <laughs> that's how I work, okay? Uh, but it's called Thriving in Babylon. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a study on the life of Daniel. Uh, and, uh, and it's just, it, it, it kind of shares the, the idea that how do we represent Christ in, in a culture that isn't necessarily a fan of Christ, that doesn't necessarily recognize his authority or his word or anything like that. So uh, I encourage you to pick it up. It's by a guy named Larry Osborne. If uh, you don't know how Amazon works, we're going to have some copies available next week here that you can purchase. Uh, but uh, I'd encourage you to go ahead and download it, pick it up, whatever you want to do, because uh, it's a really good read. And it may help you in terms of a perspective. If you don't like the way things are going uh, in our country or in this world, then that will help you to really understand it maybe from God's perspective about a biblical response uh, to things. So I hope that helps, and I hope that uh, uh, if you have more questions about this or you want to pursue a conversation and talk about why uh, I shared what I shared and where we stand, then feel free to engage me in conversation. Uh, call, make an appointment, email me. Uh, would love to continue the conversation uh, because, again, my calling and my goal is to represent Christ to this world, his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his life, his way. Now, speaking of books, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, that is okay. Grab one of these in the pew around you, turn to page 1,249, and you will find Philippians chapter 3 right there. We're continuing our study called A Letter to Friends. The Apostle Paul uh, wrote this letter to his friends in Philippi. And while you're finding Philippians 3, let me ask you a question. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Uh, now, that's a significant question because our desires drive our lives. Our wants, our cravings, our, 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 the things that are deep down in soul drive our lives. If you don't realize that, then, then this is really important to grasp because if you're aware what your desires are, that's great. If you're unaware, they're going to drive you anyway. So if a genie popped out of your toaster tomorrow morning, well, you don't have lamps anymore, do you? Uh, and uh, offered you one wish. I know some of you are thinking, don't I get three wishes? Don't be greedy. Okay? <laughs> you got one wish. Uh, what would it be? Now, before you answer that, uh, here's more rules. You can't wish for something that directly affects other people, like world peace or the end of hunger or that everybody believes in Jesus. This is about you. What do you want? What do you desire? What do you crave? And, and don't come up with some spiritual answer because you're sitting in church. <laughs> well, I know what I should answer. I'll write that down. No, God knows your heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's in your mind. So what is it really that you want? You see, some people, well, they desire wealth. They want to be rich. They want to make a lot of money, inherit a lot of money, win a lot of money. Uh, they just want money. Some people want to be loved. And they're willing to compromise their values, their morals, their self-esteem to get a weak substitute called affection. Some people crave control. And they spend their life trying to manipulate or control uh, the people around them, whether it's their kids or their family or their friends. And sometimes they use threats and sometimes they use bribes, but they just want to control. Some people want peace. They want real peace. And because they can't find inner peace, they try to numb themselves uh, as an imitation of peace through substances. Some people desire recognition and fame. And if they can't get it honorably, well, then they defame themselves just to be known for a moment, right? Because that's why there's a proliferation of uh, pseudo-reality TV shows out there, because people are willing to shame themselves for fame. 
So what is it that you want? What do you desire today? The Apostle Paul tells us and his friends in Philippi what he desires more than anything else. Listen and see if you can figure out his answer. And the answer that he hopes we'll apply to our lives. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers, those who would mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul tells us his ultimate desire to know Christ. The ultimate desire to know Christ. This is what Paul can control. This is what he can fulfill in his life. Now, he states other wants in other letters that he writes. If you read the Apostle Paul, you find that he wants the church and the church people to get along in unity. He wants people to love each other and treat each other with kindness and respect. Paul wants people everywhere to come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. In fact, in the letter to Romans, he actually says, I would go to hell if my countrymen, my fellow Jews, would believe in Jesus. That's how desperately he wants his people to know his Lord. But Paul can't control other people. Just himself. Same is true of you and me. We can't control anyone but ourselves. Paul states his desire to know Christ. And he says, I want to know Christ and everything else in life is for the rubbish heap. For the rubbish heap. Did you catch that? Verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He says everything else is for the rubbish heap. Everything else is worthless compared to the value of knowing Jesus. Even the really good stuff. And and Paul is talking to Christians in Philippi, and he points out the rubbish of religious zeal. He says, hey, this doesn't work for you. Being a good person doesn't work for you. Here's the history. There was this group of people, these Christians, that were following the Apostle Paul around everywhere he went, and they were called Judaizers uh, by historian. They were people that believed that in order to follow Jesus, you had to first become a Jew. So if you, were, if you were a guy, guess what? You had to get circumcised. And then you had to follow all the Jewish laws, observe all the Jewish holidays, all their festivals, in order to believe in Jesus. Now, Paul didn't believe that, obviously. So he calls these guys dogs, mutilators of the flesh, people who want you to get circumcised. He says, they're just, they're just ruining your body because they want you to follow these laws. And he says, look, being religious doesn't cut it. These guys tell you how good they are. He goes, I'm better. (laughs) That's kind of a throw down there. The Apostle Paul goes, look, they think they're righteous. They think they're good people. I'm better. He says, look, I was born uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was circumcised on the eighth day, which is what the law demands. Uh, You know, I was in the tribe of Benjamin. You know what that means? That means he's a pure blood. He says, I can trace my lineage back. I'm a pure Jew. He says, you think you've got it all together as to the law? I was a Pharisee. In other words, I would committed my life to studying the law and observing the law, and I persecuted the church. I was so into it. 
He goes, when, when I was held up my life against the law, I was blameless. In other words, Paul's saying, you didn't know anybody better than me. You think you're a good person, I was a better person. And he says, none of it worked for me. None of it. You know what he's saying, real bluntly? You can't be good enough to get into heaven. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. You desperately need Jesus. All of our good deeds, all of our religious works, all of our demonstrations of purity and sacrifice before God, well, they're just a pile of dung. That's what he says. That's what rubbish translates into. Dung. It's a load. <laughs> it is. So if you're sitting here, and, and look, he's using strong language here. He's, he's used a whole bunch of it in this passage. I mean, he's calling people dogs. He's not really you know, holding back here. He, he wants you to get it because if you're sitting here thinking, I'm good enough to get into heaven, Paul wants you to know you're wrong. You don't stand a chance. The righteousness that comes by, from God is through faith. If you want to get to heaven, then you have to make Jesus Christ your Lord, your Savior. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You have to believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. And he was raised from the dead. And then you have to make a commitment to Jesus to follow Jesus with your life. Saying, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my boss, you're my master. I'm going to live your way. That's what Paul is saying. He says that righteousness that you want is through faith. So if you're hoping to gain eternal life through your own goodness, give it up. It's not going to work. Now that was Paul's audience. So allow me to address a similar threat to Christians and to churches in our culture. Let's call this the rubbish of Jesus flavor. Jesus flavor. In other words, do you want Jesus or do you want the flavor of Jesus in your life? Do you want Jesus or do you want the flavor of Jesus in your life? I wrote that down and then I thought about cheese. I thought about cheese um, because uh, I grew up on this. You guys grew up on this? You know, little individual slices you get to unwrap. And as a kid, you said, I want a piece of cheese. Uh, and then as you grow up and you learn to read packages, you discover that this is not really cheese. <laughs> It even tells you that on the package that this is not cheese. It is pasteurized, prepared cheese product. In other words, this is something that is flavored cheese. It's just cheese flavored stuff. Okay? And it might taste good, and you might love to make grilled, it makes perfect grilled cheese sandwiches because it's the size of the bread, right? And, and you know, and you, and you, feel, and you may feel, still feed it to your kids, and some of you may like this, but this is not cheese. This is cheese flavored stuff. This is cheese. This is Gouda. <laughs> Some of you really like that because you're cheese snobs. But, uh, <laughs> but this is the real deal. It's 100%. It's, it's premium Dutch quality cheese. I, I feel you know, a little bit more uh, classy just because I'm holding a piece of Gouda in my hand. I didn't even know this was like a name of a cheese until a few years ago. But uh, you know, there's a difference between cheese and cheese-flavored product. And there's a difference between knowing Christ and having the flavor of Christ in your life. See, in reality, do you want Jesus or do you want the stuff Jesus can give you? Here's the temptation. We want a better marriage. We want a healthier family. We want good kids. We want more peace in our life. So we decide to hang out with Jesus. Maybe get a little Jesus flavor in our life. So we come to church, you know, most of the time. Uh, we pick and choose some of the truths that we hear and we kind of apply those to our lives. Uh, and then we wonder why our lives don't change. And so we live a frustrated spiritual life with moments of joy and visitations of peace and glimpses of purpose and children who walk away from the church when they leave home. Paul challenges us to be all in for Jesus. I count everything as lost for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You see, Jesus doesn't want to flavor your life. Jesus wants to own your life. And if you desire Jesus to change your life, to heal your marriage, to impact your kids, then 
he'll do that if you desire him, if you want him, if you want to know him. So let's talk about knowing Christ. Because Paul says in verse 10 that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. I want to know Christ. Now obviously, just using the phrase knowing Christ, this is not about religious activity. This is about a relationship. A relationship with the living God. A life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we ask you all the time, have you experienced this life-changing relationship with Jesus? Because it's not about being a good person, going to church and all that kind of stuff. In fact, Jesus warned people about being religious. In Matthew 7, he talked about Judgment Day. And he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. But on that day, many will say to me, Lord, hey, I prophesied in your name and I I cast out demons in your name, perform miracles in your name. That's what Jesus says. He says, but I will say to them, depart from me, you wicked ones, for I never knew you. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. You were using the words, you were flavoring your life, but you weren't part of me. I never knew you. Now this relationship begins when you confess Jesus as Lord. But if you really want to know Christ, it requires some things. It requires knowing his word. Knowing his word. You can't really know Jesus unless you read his letter to us. Guys, the reason we offer Bibles for anybody who wants them is because we want you to read the Word of God because we want you to know Christ. And it's not going to happen until you take His Word and put it in your life. Jesus said so. He said in John chapter 8, If you abide or remain or live in my words, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and that truth will set you free. But you got to know it. you got to live in it. you got to abide in it. The Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy in the second letter, he says, All Scripture is God-breathed. Literally, it comes out of the person of God. And it's profitable for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, it's going to change your life if you read it, if you put it in your life. So if you want to know Jesus, you got to read the Bible. You go, I don't know where to start. I, I want to do it, but I don't know where to start. Well, then start with Jesus. Read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Pick one of them and just read it and, and start asking God to teach you, and he will do that. Read a Gospel and then read one of the Paul's letters, like Philippians. You know, half the New Testament is written by Paul. Just read one of his. And, and then go back and read another Gospel and read another letter to Paul, and, and God will start speaking to you and teaching your life. You want to know Christ, it requires knowing his word, and it requires having conversations. What we call praying. Praying. Uh, I know a lot of us pray, but this is more than just bedtimes and mealtimes and and stuff like that. See, knowing Jesus is a relationship, and how do relationships actually grow? Ever think about this? How do relationships actually happen? There's two things that have to be present for a relationship to grow. Number one is communication. You got to communicate. Verbally, non-verbally, doesn't matter. There has to be communication if there's going to be a relationship. And secondly, you've got to share experiences. Whether they're experiences that you talk about or whether they're experiences together, uh, that's how relationships grow. And so we need to be talking with God as we're following Jesus with our lives. It means we need to be honest with God about everything. And, and, and I know uh, some of you don't, don't know how to pray. You go, I don't, I don't know how to pray. Just tell God what you're thinking. Ask God questions. Here's what happens. You start asking God questions, God will answer your questions. No, not verbally, out loud. He'll freak you out if he did that, Okay takes over your, you know, car, you know, and starts speaking to you on the radio. You just be like, crash or something. You get to see Jesus face to face fast then. <laughs> now, he doesn't send you emails. That would be really nice, wouldn't it? No, but if you ask God a question and you start listening for the answer, you'd be amazed at what people say to you or the things that you pick up and read, whether it's the Bible or another book, and suddenly God is communicating. And you go, wow, that's from God. That's the answer. 
So tell God what you're feeling. Ask God questions. Vent to God when you're angry. Oh, I couldn't tell God I was angry. Why not? He knows it anyway. So go ahead and vent to him. Just say, God, here's what I'm not happy about. Maybe you're not happy with God. Maybe you're not happy with life. Go ahead and vent. You know, here's the thing, guys. He already knows what you're thinking, and he already knows the words you're thinking. Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead and express yourself to God because that's what communication is. Have that conversation with God. And it's not easy at first. I'm not pretending this is easy. Right now, some of you are thinking, I don't know how to pray. This would be really awkward. Yeah, it would. Kind of like your first date with your spouse. Do you guys remember your first date with your spouse? Some of you are like, no. <laughs> okay, then ask them. Maybe they do. First date. I remember my first date with Morado was about 35 years ago. And, uh, and, and it was awkward and shallow conversation. What I remember most and it is that, uh, you know, we stood there at her door for like 30 minutes having that awkward conversation while I was trying to work up the nerve to kiss her, okay? <laughs> just, just reality. Apparently it worked because, you know, we've been married 31 years now. But, uh, but, you know, that awkward conversation at the beginning, which is halting and, and, and confusing and you're afraid you're going to say the wrong thing and stuff like that. Now, after being married 31 years... We can talk about anything. The, the conversation is comfortable and it's deep and, 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 and it's constant and we communicate. We don't even have to use words all the time. Oh, she has to really just raise her eyebrow the right way and I'm like, got it. <laughs> I understand perfectly that I'm saying too much. Um, that's how it is with God. You have to pursue that relationship. If you want to know Christ, you got to read his word. you got to talk to him. So that that relationship can develop. And when we do that, when we pursue knowing Christ, here's what happens. Here's the results in our life. Here's what Paul tells us. First of all, we experience the power of his resurrection. Now that's cool, isn't it? The power of the resurrection. Jesus defeated death. He defeated hell. He walked out of the tomb. And, and, and this is what we want to be able to say, I have the power, this death-defying, world-changing, overcoming power of God. Who wants it? Nobody. Nobody. Seriously? Who wants the power of God? Yeah. See, we want the power of God. And, and the way you get the power of God is by knowing Christ. The better that you know Christ, the more power of God is in your life. It is that simple. It, it really is. And then, as we know Christ, it results in sharing in his sufferings. <laughs> Not so cool. We're all like, yeah, I like the power of the resurrection part. Can we stop there? No, you can't. Knowing Christ means that you experience the sharing in his sufferings. Jesus told his disciples, the world hates me. Guess what? It's going to hate you too. You immerse yourself in Jesus and you will share his sufferings. But think about this. Is there anybody that you care deeply about that you're not willing to share in their sufferings? Right? I mean, what kind of friend are you when you find out that your friend's got it going through a really tough patch and you go, hey, tell you what, call me when you're done suffering. <laughs> we'll hang out. Yeah, you're, you're a lousy friend. I don't think they even call you a friend. Okay, here's the deal. Whatever suffering you're going through, Jesus is going to walk with you through that. And he invites you to experience his sufferings with him. What does that mean? It means understanding the pain and brokenness and sorrow of people's self-destructive behavior that you love. It, it means understanding the pain of rejection and betrayal and slander directed at you. It, it means understanding the grief of people who walk away from God. I, I mean, some of you are grieving the fact that your children are walking away from God and it breaks your heart. And now you understand how God feels when he sees us. It's understanding the reality of persecution and the brokenness of the hurting. You see, you can't really know Jesus without learning to forgive your detractors. You can't really know Jesus without learning to love your enemies or blessing those who curse you. That's sharing in his sufferings. So the better you know Christ, the more power you're going to have in your life, the more you're going to share in his sufferings, and then you're conformed to his death, becoming like him in his death. And, and that just makes you kind of go, what? What does that mean, becoming like him in his death, conforming to his death? It's really simple. 
It means that we obey God the same way that Jesus did, all the way to the point of death. That's what Philippians 2.8 says, that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So here's a, here's a question. How badly do you really want to know Christ? Because if you want to know Christ, then Christ is going to call you to obey. Because the more that we obey, then that means the more that we trust Jesus. Do you get that? You, you, relationships are built on trust, right? Healthy relationships are immersed in trust. 35 years with Meralda, I know she's going to act in my benefit. She's, she's going to do that. I trust her to do that. And, and that's why we have a relationship that we do. And here's the thing with God. I, I, I trust that God's going to act for my benefit. Even when I don't understand how he's going to work or what he's going to do in my life. And so I'm going to trust him and I trust him. I demonstrate that trust by obedience. And, and as I trust God, as I obey him, then my trust level goes up because I see God work. I see God bless because God is faithful. He doesn't always bless the way I want him to. He doesn't always, you know, bless the, the way I'm looking for. But he always blesses better than what I expect. And so then my trust level goes up and God calls me into a deeper commitment of obedience. A more challenging step of obedience, if you will. So what is God asking you to do today in terms of obedience? You know, if you're a follower of Christ, I just have this conviction that you already know what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do. You know what things he's asking you to stop doing. You know what things he's asking you to start doing. You know what steps of obedience that, that God wants you to take because that's what conviction's all about. Will you trust him enough to do that? Whatever he asks. It's for your benefit. You see, if you want to know Christ, you'll do it. And see, all of this leads to the ultimate promise, the resurrection of the dead. You see, to know Christ is eternal life. That's why it's worth sacrificing everything else for it. Because the better we know Jesus, the more life we experience. Paul said, I want to know Christ. Power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Today, I want to know Christ. What is it that you want? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us life in Jesus. We are hopeless without him. And God, I pray that every person in this room would desire to know you more so that you might fill their life with joy, with grace, and with peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a moment. We're